And um, I want you to tell us the, the story about the killer bulls that you dealt with. Um, at, at one stage, I can't remember what area it was, but um, just one an interesting chapter in your in your time as a in, in national parks. I was the for five years. I was the game senior game ranger in charge of the Binga district, um, which is in the upper reaches of Lake Kariba in in southern Rhodesia in those days, and uh, they had moved Lake Kariba to filter capacity in '63. I moved there in 64 and uh, they had moved out of the valley. The, the water filled up this gigantic valley, which is at, I think, 280 miles, 280 kilometers long, um, two, yeah, long, and uh, about 25 wide at the widest point. Um, they moved out of the valley onto both sides of the Zambezi, one to Zambia, one on the, on the southern Rhodesian side. They moved out um, 57,000 Batonka people, men, women, and children. They had lived there for hundreds and hundreds of years. They were Iron Age people. They were very, very primitive people. They were lovely people to work with. A bit frustrating, but, but nice people to work with. And um, they had lived along the Zambezi River, growing crops in, on, the, on the soils along the river. Crop, uh, soils that were every year were flooded by the Zambezi when the river came down in flood and they had silt deposited on top. So they were constantly enriched by the river. And they used to grow a sorghum crop there that was 12, 14, 15 feet tall. And it had bunches, bunches of, 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 of sorghum up about this, this size, um, hanging from 14 feet above the ground. And the Patanka used to let them ripen and then cut those off because that was their main meal. They made their beers and they made their food and everything out of those sorghums. And then they cut the stalk, stalks down and ate them like sugarcane. So it was an important crop for them. And there were a lot, lot of other crops that grew on those soils. Now, away from the river, all the, all the felt was, was largely Mopani felt. There were a few black soil things along the special areas on the river. Um, but most of it was Kalahari sand, blown in from the desert thousands of years ago. And these crops couldn't grow in that sandy soil. So for those villages that had that we managed in the early days to get pockets of black soil were very lucky. And on this occasion, uh, there was a place just south of Siobur, on the uh, south of the Nabusenga River, where there was a very nice patch of black soil, and there was a, a really good crop of, of, of those giant sorghum. Um, it grew so close that when you walked through it, you couldn't walk. It was, it was like, literally like sugarcane. Um, and when, when, when the, the crop started to seed, the top of it was just filled with, with grain. And the elephants used to go in there and they would just stand in there all day long eating the grain, just breaking it off and eating it. And then the Patonkas had, had no rifles. They had no means of chasing them away. They used to get tin cans and beat them with sticks or fill them with rocks and rattle them and run around and get firebrands from their fire and chase them off. Um, and these, most of the time, big bulls, it was the bulls only that crop. The cows don't crop raid. I've never come across a cow herd crop raiding, but the bulls go in when the grain is like that, they can't resist it. And these poor primitive people who would come out at night when the crops were being eaten and they'd run in, in amongst everything up to where the elephants are banging tins and shouting and screaming and firebrands and everything, anything to get rid of them, throwing sticks at them, throwing stones at them, anything. And uh, after a while, if it goes on regularly, these elephants get absolutely brassed off. And they just turn and, and charge these guys and either knock them out of the way or they make a good job of it. And in this case, they made a good job of the old headman. I was called in early. The, it, uh, he was killed in the middle of the night, um, about 50, 60 miles from where I was living at Binga in the Binga village. And uh, I got there fairly early in the morning. And uh, this little picking in, it's always a little picking in takes you in. He uh, took me in through, through the mealies, through the, 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 uh, the crops to where the body was lying. And the body then was on the edge of the field and um, the elephants had pushed down a whole lot of Mopani trees. Um, they had clearly picked him up by his legs and they had beaten his body against, against a tree trunk. His skull was broken off at the top above his eyebrows. The whole top of his skull came off. His, his brain had just disappeared, but somebody had gone out and found the brain and brought it back and put it on a 
pad of little of, of green leaves next to the body. Um, his eyes were open and covered in, in dust, and he looked like a Neanderthal man gone wrong. Um, his stomach was hanging out. They had trampled him. They had dragged him through the ground. His intestines were just in shreds and covered in, in gray Mapani soil. And his arms were broken off. They were sticking out in his legs, sticking out like broken sort of piping building. Um, and he was a hell of a mess. And he was covered in flies. I don't know if you want to know this. There are two kinds of flies that just, dis just disappear from nowhere when a, when a body, not in, just a human body, even just shoot an elephant in the bush in Africa. Within minutes of the animal being dead, these flies come in. There's a little gray checkered fly comes in. He lays, he lays larvae in the little cracks wherever he, or an open wound or whatever. And then those things immediately hatch into little worms. Then you get the big blue bottle, which lays eggs. And they come out, they hatch out, and, and all sorts of things happen then. And uh, very soon you've got the whole area is like a swarm of bees with flies. They get really, it, where they come from, I have no idea. His body was covered in flies. There's a little old lady sitting there with a, a waft of sticks of leaves, wafting the flies off to keep them off the body. And anyway, this little picking in took me in there, and I found out what had happened. And I said, okay, I was actually mes mesmerized by, by this because I looked at the body and I thought, <laughs> Yeah, but, but the grace of God go I, because, you know, <laughs> it nearly happened to me so many times. But anyway, um, we eventually got onto the tracks where the other elephants just all got up and they took off and they ran storm through through this, these canes like a, like a bulldozer going through. And uh, the, there was no problem with tracking. You could run on the tracks. And my two Bushman tracker, Ben and them, Joyce, they, um, they held hell from the Kalahari. Um, they were, their blood was also up. They wanted to get revenge for this old man. And they were running on the spore and I had to stop them. I said, hey, you guys, slow down, slow down. I can't keep up with you. You're going too fast. So we, we followed them for a long way. And um, all, all the little pickings wanted, we, I always took people with me so that they could see where the elephant carcass was so they could come back and get the meat. It was their job to cut out the ivory and then I would come back and pick up the tusks from the village in a month's time. I'd never cut the ivory out. The villagers always did it. But I had to have somebody with me to, so they could come with me and they could see where the, dead, where the elephant was when we'd killed it, mm. or elephants if there were more than one. And um, I, I eventually selected two during the middle of the day. It was very hot, and we went through a lot of water. But it's very hard to carry a water bag full of water. And it was also, you must remember, remember it was my job to shoot the elephant. It was not my job to carry the water. It was my tracker's job to, to do the tracking, not to carry the water. So these people who came to find out where the elephants, the dead elephants were, they carried the water. They became our water carriers. And so we set off. We came to the Nabusenga River where the elephants had stopped to feed. And I worked out later that it wasn't necessarily the feeding that was important. It was the fact that just on the other bank, there was a road that went between Binga and Siabua, and it was the main road through the middle of the Zambezi Valley. And these elephants knew this. So they stopped there to listen to see if there were any vehicles on the road for a little while. And then across the road, and then off they went and they were on an, a big old ancient elephant path that went straight off towards the Chisorita mountain range. And way in the distance, I could see a cleft in the, in the in my, was, this is 2000 feet of mountain um, in, uh, above the, the local valley floor. And I could see a gap in the ridge and I knew that that gap was where the Ruziruhuru river came out uh, and went down into the lake. And they were heading straight, straight for that. Now, um, we got onto the tracks and followed them all the way along the way. Wherever there was a lump of dung, the dung was filled with undigested um, um, sorghum grain. And there were guinea fowl on it. There were franklins on it. The squirrels would come down out of the trees and they'd eat. They'd, go and they'd, they'd suck the juice, the, the liquid out, out of the dung because it was the only way they could get food. Filled their che cheeks full of grain and then up back into a hole in the Mopani tree. It was quite interesting. We followed them on, and these elephants never stopped. They, they, they weren't running, but they weren't walking. They were just, they were hurrying along. They, they eventually went down, down the bank into, into the, 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 the gap, the, the gorge of the Rizirhuda River where there was a big pool of water. Mm -hmm. And this was about midday. We were quite exhausted at that stage. They went down, down to the river. They had a bath in the river. I think they were so full of blood and guts of the, of the old headman, they wanted to get rid of that smell. So they then got out the other side and they walked into the gorge and they walked off to one side. 
and um, the river, when I say a river, it wasn't all that big. It was as wide as your sitting room at the most, but there were big pools in it here and there. And um, there was a level bit on the one side with an elephant path going in, which we walked along because the elephants followed it in like that. And then we came in not long after the pool and we kept hand side, there was a big, a big thick bush. And um, we stopped there and the trackers stopped and they, and they stopped and they listened and they pointed into the bush and they said, the elephants are in there. And I looked at this bush and it was just like this. And all the way along the road, I'd been thinking about this mangled old guy and I didn't want to end up being like him. And now I'm after them. And there were five, five big elephant bulls in this group. And uh, anyway, we stopped and we listened and then you heard the doof, doof, doof which is the elephants dropping their dung, hitting the ground. You can hear it, it's a dull thud as it hits the ground. So that told me definitely the elephants were in there. We used to carry little bags uh, um, of ash. We used to get a handkerchief and fill it with last night's white wood ash and tie a little knot in the top. So you've got this little bag and when you waft it like this or click it like that, a puff of, of white ash comes out and you can see which way the wind is blowing. Used to say, used to make the invisible wind visible. And then we knew which way the wind was blowing. So we said, well, the only way to do this now, because the wind is going slightly upstream, is to go in the top end of this and we'll come in behind them like this and, and see where they are. It, it wasn't terribly extensive. It was big enough to hide five big elephant bulls. And underneath, under underfoot, there had been a shower of rain. Um, so it, the, the leaf litter, which was about six to nine inches thick, from several winters of leaf four, um, was damp on the top, but underneath it was dry. This is a funny thing about after a rain in those thickets is that the ground underneath doesn't get wet until you get a really good deluge. And this was important at the time because we were walking through the leaves and they make a hell of a lot of noise. How do you, how do six people walk through, they've got, they, well, five people, me, my two trackers and the two, two guys carrying the water bags. How do you walk through that? silently is very difficult and anyway I turned around to get a drink of water because I really needed a drink of water then and the two guys carrying the water bags were gone they heard the elephants and they were gone that left with me and my trackers and we were raging had raging thirst and we, we, you really get cross with these guys when they do that sort of thing anyway we got in the other side we started going towards them walking very quietly and you've got to walk around bushes and under bushes because there are all sorts of branches over the way the elephants of course storm through but they still leave bushes sticks in the way and we got we're moving towards them and uh, then then suddenly there was silence uh, i was walking along um, trying to listen to see what was going on and the next thing i know is that joyce who was carrying my 9.3 he was also carrying Ben was carrying my, fat, my big elephant rifle. Joyce was carrying a 9.3, which is smaller, but adequate for elephants. And, um, uh, and I was in the front and Joyce jammed me in the bum with the, with the end of his rifle, clop, 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 like this. And he said, and he pointed ahead. I was switched off. I was looking and thinking of other things. And when I looked up, I saw four elephant trunks sticking up above the bushes like this, right in front of me. And they were, they had obviously picked up our scent. So uh, we, we all froze, absolutely froze still. And then I said, there were five elephant. Where's the other one? Is it this side? Is it that side? Where is it that we, we didn't know? And it was important that we did know because if we were going to be attacked in that, in that thick bush by five elephant bulls, which were already their, their spirit was up from having killed the old man, um, we wanted to know where every elephant was. And we, I realized if those elephants charged me now at that point in time, I would only see them at about five yards range in front of me. That was, that was the length of time I would have to take aim at the brain and pull the trigger. And you get the first one, yes, but then you've got to reload and then the next one's closer and then the next one's closer and you're virtually shooting them by putting the weapon against their head. Um, but these jumbos, we froze, they froze. Fortunately, the air was okay. And then Joy said, my tracker said to me, mm, and he did this with his fingers. And that indicated that inside the thicket, the wind wasn't blowing this way. It was going round and round and round. So it's going to be difficult to know where we go in. So now we're confronted with four elephant bull trunks. There's a fifth one somewhere we don't know where. And they'd got our wind. 
if we stepped on, on the next foot we went forward would be a crushing sound of, of standing on dead leaves. And, and we, it was, we were actually in a very difficult pre predicament. And then um, we just froze and we waited. We said, no, we've just got to wait here. So just stand dead still, don't make a sound, don't move. So we, we, we still stood dead still and we waited. And then suddenly one of the elephants, uh, was a question who would break first? Would we break and run or would they, would they break and run? So it would be very infradig for me to break and run. I can tell you with my trackers and everybody there, I would never live it down. So anyway, what happened? They, they, they decided to break and run and they must have forgotten where they were because they ran off in, in, they started moving off in that direction, walking first of all, and then walking faster and faster and then running. So when, when that happened, and Joyce said, come on, let's go, you see. So off we went and we ran after them flat out. I had my four, five, eight rifle in my hand, went up the spot on safe, running like hell after these elephants. And as they were running through the bush, they were kicking up the leaves and the, and the soil underneath. And as I say, the soil underneath was dry. So he ended up with a massive big cloud of dust. And these elephants were just going, you could just hear them just roaring through the bushes they were running and they were running towards the mountain, but the, the thicket was on a flat bit of ground. And when they broke out the other side, they looked in front of them and the, the mountain side just went up like this in a slope. They could climb it. But one thing about elephants is they can't, elephants can't climb a hill as fast as I can climb a hill. They're very slow at getting their big weights up and, and what have you. And I often, in other situations, I would run past the elephants. So if they're walking up a hill, I would run past them like this and get on, on above them so that I could shoot them um, from the top. But in, in this case, I thought if they're going, if we hit this, and I was anticipating getting there and finding five bull elephants walking up the hill, which would have been, I would have taken all, all five of them out then together, no problem. Um, but what happened was the elephants got there, they looked at this hill and they said, what the hell have we let, let us in for? They turned around and they turned around straight back along the path that they had used coming out. So they'd gone there, turned around, went back the same way they, went, they reached that point. But I was on the path behind them running after them. And, and of course, I was making lots of noise then. I didn't worry about the noise because the elephants were ahead of me running also. So I didn't hear them when they turned around and ran back along the old path because the dust was thick and these jumbos were coming on as full bore now. And I was running flat out. The next thing I know, right in front of me, literally five yards in front of me, this elephant's head bursts out of the bush, coming full bore. And I, I picked my rifle up and I shot him and I killed it. And it came drop, dropping dead right at my feet. The next one ran around that side of it. And as it came around, I shot it. And no, no, sorry. I shot, I shot the one bull and put it down. And Joyce, who was standing next to me with his 9.3, I was reloading, coming to bear on this one. He fired his 9.3 at the elephant that was coming. It was right on top of us, all of us. And he hit it and it staggered back. It was close to the brain, but it missed the brain. And uh, as it was coming up to me, it flicked me like that with this trunk and just knocked me for six over. It's a hell of a smack to be hit by an elephant trunk. It's happened to me several times. And uh, I hit the ground um, on my back, boom, like that. And it knocked all the wind out of my, out of my lungs. And I was lying there on the ground, <clears throat> trying to get my wind back. <clears throat> this elephant now was staggering around and it staggered over the top of us. The next thing I knew, I, I'd lost my rifle in this impact. The one elephant was dead. The other three elephants came out from behind these two and they ran around us. The one elephant was dead there. This one was standing on its feet, but the other three ran around past us and disappeared behind us and out of the jess and away. And, uh, and I was lying on my back, still trying to get, get my breath. And um, you know, this was a long time ago. I'm gonna correct my story. I shot the second bull, as I said, to begin with. And I stunned it and I missed it. Because what happened next was that um, Joyce also fired a shot and the noise hit me in the ear or the blast hit me in the ear and my ear started ringing, I couldn't hear anything. I then hit the ground on my back, lost all my, all my wind. And this elephant meanwhile was ran over the top of me and I was underneath its belly. When I looked up, I could just see this elephant's belly above me like this. But I was in trouble, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't breathe at all. And uh, Joyce banged this thing again. And the next thing I knew was I heard this, it was, the elephant started scree screaming and trumpeting, which was another big problem. And I didn't know where it was coming from. Um, 
Anyway, Joy shot it again and hit it in the brain this time and it dropped right next to me. I felt this big thump hit, hitting next to me and I started being jostled around and I didn't know what was going on. And I was becoming, I was virtually unconscious at that stage because I couldn't get any air. The next thing I know was that I was being pulled out. I, I could feel this terrible jostling, jostling feeling. And when, when I, uh, that, that helped me to breathe. And when I, my eyes started to refocus and I looked up like this, I was lying, the elephant that I had been lying under had fallen on its side. And it's, and I was on its, I was between its back legs with my head and shoulders up against the back leg. And the top leg, the elephant lying on its side, its top leg was doing this in front of my face. And it was kicking like this because that was a, a sign that the elephant was dead. If an elephant starts kicking, you know it's dead. And uh, anyway, I, this is what came. The next thing I know is my trackers grabbed me by the ankles and pulled me out from underneath this elephant. And finally, uh, I had broken ribs, all sorts of things because of this story. And, and finally, um, the elephant stopped kicking and I got up and, and, and what have you. And then, then the guys with the water bags decided to come in because they were re re realized the story was all over and I was furious with them. But I was just so happy that, I, that, that, that was a very close encounter, one of my closest. So what happened was three of them got away, we killed two of them, and I wasn't, I wasn't in any mood or any physical condition to carry on and find the other three that day, because I was finished after that little escapade. <laughs> but there's a story for you. Ron, which, uh, which one of your books have you written up your hunting stories, or are they in all your books? They're splattered right throughout the whole series of books. There are seven in the series altogether. We're getting a bit short now. Um, we've been selling... We sold it, we wrote the book one year, we sold it, second book the second year, third book the third year, and so on. As people, as they came out, people bought them. So the earlier books now are getting fewer and fewer. The, the latter books, we've still got lots of them. But there are seven books in all where all these stories are put in like this, verbatim. Um, and these aren't stories where you go out with a professional hunter and he takes you up and you shoot him in the brain. These are real live hunting stories. Mm. Ron, um... You've still got some stock there. You've still got some of your books if people, oh, people yes. want. Oh yes. oh, yes. Anyone wants to get hold of me can do so with my email address. That's your best. The best bet is to give me an email and we can let, let you know. Or, or the other thing you can do is you can look at my website, which is Ron Thompson Books. Okay. Um, and uh, you, you'll see all the books there and they're all described in, on my website. Ron Thompson Perhaps Books, it. one word. Yeah. The, the the other thing that they can do if they want to, all these books are all on kindle now okay so you can get them those books and a lot of others i think we've, i've got about 20 books on kindle at the moment um some of them i've, I've started venturing out into fiction um where i've used my wildlife background as as a theme um uh, and in the war stories uh, during the war, I was a tracker combat unit leader for 17 years, starting in 1964, went right through to 1980. And I've written a novel based upon that, which is okay. probably better than the actual factual things. You know, you can read a factual contact. When you had a contact and you killed somebody or they nearly killed you or you, whatever happened, that's easy to tell. But when you put it in, in, uh, in novel form, it, it gives some form of spice to it. And... Uh, What's I would the, recommend it. What's, what's the title of, the, of, of that book? That novel is called um, uh, uh, The Spirit of Nehanda. And Nehanda was a, an ancestral spirit of the Mashana people. Mm -hmm. Nehanda was responsible for a lot of the atrocities that the, the, the Robert Mugabe Zanla freedom fighters perpetrated against their own people. Mm -hmm. And we did the tracking up after all those murders and things. We tracked them up, contacted them, and we shot them up or we attracted the our main problem wasn't to go and engage these guys our problem our purpose was to find them it's when we had to but um but our job was was not to engage them was to find them and then get back by radio through to the jock to the job operational command headquarters and they would then send out troops either with depending on the size of the people the or numbers of people we had found um Either they would send out paratroopers in Dakotas or they would send out helicopters with fire forces on them 
And of course, if there was a battle, we, we got involved in it. But it wasn't, it wasn't a sort of a cowboys and Indians trick where you went out and you followed them and you caught up with them and you shot them. If you had to do that, you did it. But that wasn't our purpose. Our purpose was merely to find them. So although we ourselves didn't notch up, we shot so many guys in or yesterday or whenever, that wasn't, wasn't our purpose. Our purpose was purely to find them because the other soldiers didn't know how to track. And I was use, using my Bushman trackers to do the tracking, which had mm. an advantage and a disadvantage. The, the disadvantage was that you, if you didn't use a good quality tracker, you didn't find the terrorists. If you did use a good quality fact, um, tracker, the chances of you being caught in an ambush were infinitely greater. So there were good points and bad points to both. That's a whole other story, Ron. But thanks very much for your time again today. Um, fascinating stuff. And uh, maybe, maybe we can talk about um, the war some other, some other time. Ah, or the elephants. Or, or the elephants. The issues of the elephants in Kruger and in Botswana are, are, are vast and um, it's, it's important that people understand this. Um, for example, when we, when we went into when we went into Kruger through through the bottom gate, um, we we had 10, 10 kilometers of tarmac road to get to the Bergendal rest camp where we were staying the night. It was in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And in those 10 kilometers, we passed through what used to be a woodland. And I my estimate was that of the numbers of trees that were that were there, 80% had been killed by elephants. Um, and most of them were just big skeletons sticking up in the air. Over 10 miles, sorry, 10 kilometers, um, and 20%, the, the remaining 20% had all been damaged to a greater extent or lesser extent by elephants digging the trunks um, and um, ring barking the trees. And that is something which people ought to, ought to know about, the, the, mm. what the elephants do to the trees and, mm. and, and why they die and, mm. and that sort of thing. But really from from, Berkendal, from from Malilani Gate at the south to Berkendal, which is 10, 10 kilometers, there wasn't one tree that was not either dead or very badly damaged um, through, through not quite full ring barking, but nearly there, but it was going that way. When you got to Berkendal, this is the interesting thing. When you got to Berkendal Race Camp, we went through the gate and inside fence with a big electric fence to stop elephants and lions going in there to protect the visitors. When you got inside the fence, which is probably four or five hectares in size, with, with the rest huts and the, door, the places where people sleep and eat and the offices and things, inside that perimeter fence, the woodland was totally intact. There wasn't, there were huge big trees. There were proper understory. There was continuous canopy trees. So your squirrels and your night apes and your bush babies could move from tree to tree, which you, they couldn't do outside. There was no continuous canopy tree outside all along that 10 mile, 10 mile stretch of, of habit, old habitat. When you got to the fence, the fence, you could cut the difference with a knife. Outside the fence, it was almost bare ground. Inside the fence, you had these beautiful big trees, thick, thick bush right down to the ground, thick with leaves. There were no leaves on the ground outside because there were no trees to produce the leaves. So it was like a, a a little microcosm of what the game reserve used to be like a long time ago. And everything in there, what we found in there, you didn't see, we didn't see any bush by tracks or anything for a whole week outside the rest camps. None. When you went into the rest camp, there were bush bucks living in the thick bush around mm -hmm. the huts. They had taken refuge in there. The bush babies were in their call. Every single rest camp we went into or through the park was exactly the same. Yeah. There were lots of lots of proper un, undamaged habitat inside the fence yeah. enclosures. Outside, it was mm -hmm. chalk and cheese. And if anyone wants to question whatever I've told you today, they must go into those camps and look for themselves. Look for themselves. Yes. Yeah. All right, Ron. Thanks a hell of a lot for your time. Okay. Good. <laughs>